Our text again is Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And I want to take a moment <clears throat> and speak to you from the subject matter, the yeast of men. The yeast of men. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Most holy and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together to assemble around your table that we may feast from your word. We pray that bread of heaven will come and saturate us, fill us till we want no more. Let the abundance of your word be made manifest in our lives that we will go forth and be the living epistles, the examples of Christ for which you have anointed and called us to be. We bless you for it now in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. The yeast of men. For me, when I think of the word yeast, my mind immediately goes to making bread. I picture the amount of work that goes into combining a selective set of ingredients together, eggs, flour, salt, and anything else you want to throw in there, right? And though it sounds easy enough, at least today you can take all the ingredients and throw them in a bread maker and the bread maker does all the work for you and makes all the mess, that's the easy part. But I think back to when I was a little boy and watching my grandmother and my aunts clear off the kitchen counter or the kitchen table and uh, they began to gather all these big bowls and spoons and all this other stuff that I can't even name. And they began to add these ingredients together and at some point they stopped using the spoon and the other tools and they start using their hands. Uh, you know, I have to admit I was a little taken aback by that because they're putting their hands in that which I'm going to eat later and I don't know where your hands been um, but that was just an internal thought 
nonetheless, uh, one day I decided to ask the question, why do you use your hands? Why can't you just continue to use the spoons? Uh, and, and I'm told because in order to get it all to work together, you got to get your hands in it. You have to be able to feel your way through it. You have to be able to allow this dough to speak back to you. I said, well, it, I never know flour to speak, but I'm okay. But later, in, I began to understand what they meant about the dough speaking back, because the dough would tell you when it's ready to be left alone. It will tell you when it's ready to be placed aside. But as they're kneading all of these ingredients together, and they're working that dough, and, and they're flipping it and slapping it and putting more flour on it, and they're working it, and it's at some point they begin to add something called yeast. It is a very small ingredient that has a powerful impact on whether or not this bread or these dinner rolls are going to turn out the way you anticipate. That little bit of yeast is activation. It does something inside the dough that after you leave it alone, the yeast starts to work. After they're done kneading, they, they take the dough and they put it in a bowl, uh, a bowl that's big enough to match the size of its potential. And that dough sits in there and they cover it and they find a warm place, not a hot place, but a warm place to put it where it, it won't be disturbed, the temperature can be maintained because now that you've done all the work and you put some elbow into it and you, you put some muscle into it, now the yeast must do its part. And it can only be done when it's left alone. Uh, to pause for a moment, that, well, that sounds similar to what happens to us as Christians. We were sinners being worked, out, being worked on by life. And, and, and life was doing its work on us until that active ingredient began to work its perfect work in us. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of our faith in God. We arrived at a point where sin had to start leaving us alone. Life had to leave us alone so that God can begin to work his perfect where he can begin to activate that main ingredient in our lives. But anyway, that dough has been left aside and time, an hour, two hours, three hours, depending on how far you need this, this dough to expand. At some point, it's ready to be worked on again. And they take that dough out and they slap it out of the bowl and they pull it out from the size of the bowl and they're starting to flour it and work it and use it again and they put it in the pan, they stick it in the oven, and now the bread is baking. The yeast of men is very similar. It is that vain philosophy. It's those small little words that people speak that they try to infiltrate our subconscious. It's words that they use that establish tradition. These are words that are used that uh, try to convince us about the validity of God. It's those words that they use to uh, justify modern day agenda to say that sin is no longer sin. This text this book, these words were spoken thousands and thousands of years ago. And in this book we call the Bible, the Holy Writ of God, it's there that we find that God was speaking to humanity since the dawn of time, establishing principles, solidifying laws, rules, and regulations. It is there that we find the standard of the Lord to determine what is right in his sight and what is wrong in ours. It's in these words 
that he has established his point of view, that he's given us a roadmap to follow, a guide to lead us. It is in those words that he established what is righteous and what is unrighteous. It's God's word, his living and breathing word spoken into humanity that we would be the instruments that he has called and ordained for us to be. How ironic that there are words spoken today to say that God has finally changed his mind. God has been faithful and consistent throughout time and history. His word has not changed. The Bible declares that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changes not. His words, his promises are yea and amen. God is firm in what he said. He is firm in what he says. And he is firm in what he continues to say. He does not change his word. The word of the Lord declared that he will send his word out and it would accomplish what he has sent it to do. It shall not return unto him void. His word remains. This heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word shall remain. And yet today there are those who say God changed his mind. That sin is no longer sin. I submit to you that if God stands on sin is what the book says, then the book changes not. The traditions of men, the yeast of men will forever change based on societal norms. But God doesn't change. God does not submit himself to be changed or to be uh, to convert to our way of thinking. But yet we are to change and to convert ourselves into the way of God. What am I getting at? There are words spoken today to try to convince us that Jesus never died on the cross. That all of this is merely a good bedtime story that we've been telling our children and a lie that we've been standing on for over 2,000 years. One thing I can tell you with great certainty, first of all, that when a lie is spoken, it only is going to last but so long. Eventually, the truth will find that lie out. You see, a lie can only fly, but truth stands. Truth will declare truth and expose every lie it's virtually impossible for the world and all of God's people all of us Christians I'm talking about the real Christians not the churchgoers all of us after all this time we still stand on God's word and his promises and we still declare that Jesus he died on Calvary's cross he was placed in a borrowed tomb he went down into the pit of hell, preached the revival, took the keys of death in the grave and stripped the devil of all his power, rose on the third day, ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God. I know that to be true. I don't have to read it to know it because every day that I wake up in the morning that my eyes are open and there's breath in my body and the blood still flows through my veins, I am a living witness and a testimony that God is alive and well. I know that God is real and I know that he died for my sins because in a moment where I'm ill in my body and I need healing, God, he touches me. And I begin to feel the power of God working in my life when I'm going through life struggles and I'm met with life challenges. It's something about the power of God at work in the life of his people. Oh, the peace that comes over us. The power of God saturated in our lives. There are words spoken that our Jesus, 
that he was married to Mary Magdalene and that together they established a family. I don't know if that's true or not. It doesn't matter. What matters is that I know that my Jesus, our Jesus, according to the book, was without sin. He knew no sin, and yet he died for our sins. I know that this Jesus, the one that this book talks about, I know that he came down from heaven. He walked the earth. He performed miracle after miracle. He did what no other could do. He did more than open blinded eyes. He did more than allow the lame to walk and heal lepers. He did more than turning water into wine. He did more than calling a man's name and he walked from the grave. He did more than that. The greatest miracle of all is that when he went into the garden of Gethsemane to pray, he had me on his mind. He had you on his mind. The greatest miracle of all is that he died for our sins. He did what we could not do. He paid the ultimate price. The ultimate price wasn't the cross. The ultimate price was in that moment that God turned his back. He could not look on sin. In that moment, he experienced hell. In that moment, he knows what it feels like to be without the Heavenly Father. In that moment, he knows what it means to be separated from eternity. In that moment, he chose to still stay on that cross for you and I. In that moment. Oh, he's, he, he is well acquainted with our grief. He's well acquainted with our circumstances. He's well acquainted with life as we know it. When he was in the wilderness being tempted of the devil, he knows what it's like to go through temptation. But through it all, he taught us how to survive. He taught us how to make it through. He taught us how to stand on the one thing that is all consistent and all powerful, and that is the unadulterated, unequivocal, unequivocal word of God. When all else fails, in these, in the yeast of men, as they try to supplant thoughts in our minds that hopefully, that they think will make, take root in our hearts, that we'll begin to doubt the essence of the Lord and the power of God at work. I, 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 I know, I know, I know, because you know, the human side of us, because we always want to make an excuse for why we, we may doubt or we may not fully believe. Because when we're going through, we want an answer today. But sometimes in God's time, that answer may come next week or even a year later. But by faith, we know that whenever that answer comes, it's coming from the Lord. When God is ready for us to receive it. But they're trying to supplant thoughts and corrupt the church. They're trying to tell us that our faith is in vain. The yeast of men, that if we allow it to germinate in our base, if we allow it to be kneaded into our lives, oh, it would wreak havoc. But I stand here to say to you that the yeast of men is not greater than the word of the Lord. Our text point out for us in verse 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through, through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. This is a real simple statement, and I'm saying it in the broken English that I choose at this moment. If it ain't Jesus, it ain't right. If it ain't Jesus, it ain't right. If it ain't Jesus, it ain't right. Okay, it isn't right. They will try to tell us that because of modern day uh, social norms, we as the church must 
be willing to conform to social norms in order that we may be inviting uh, the world into our environment. I, I share with you that in the emergency room of a hospital, it's designed to do one thing. It's designed to deal with the emergency, medical emergencies of life. It's not meant to be a doctor's office. It's not meant to be the dentist's office. It's meant to deal with emergencies. No matter how far gone technology gets, no matter how far advanced we get in medicine, the emergency room is still the emergency room. It will not change. If you're bleeding and you're dying, that's the place to go because they have the tools and the equipment and the knowledge to be able to deal with it. Well, I stand here to tell you that this this place, the household of prayer, the house of God, the house of worship, the church, it will not change. It still is a place of holiness, and holiness without no man shall see God. It's in this place that sin is still sin, no matter what kind of sin, no matter what name you put on it, sin is still sin in the sight of God. Amen, somebody. Amen. Just because society has changed does not mean God has changed. You may not like it, you may not even love it, but it's still God. And as I said a moment ago, if it ain't Jesus, it ain't right. We do not need to change how we are as believers, as Christians, as those who uphold the truth of God, simply because the world don't like the truth. Well, the Bible says that the truth, to know the truth, it shall set you, it shall make you free. And the world will never be free for as long as we continue to hold back the truth. And the truth is that in the eyes of God, sin is as witchcraft. And the only resolution God has for is to destroy it. But thanks be unto God that through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed. Uh, we don't speak with a tongue of judgment. People are what they are. They do what they do because we were once there too. But we do speak with a tongue of truth. That if you keep living a life of sin, you will suffer the reward of sin. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The traditions of men are set to where it make one have be lovers of themselves. To gratify oneself. Today, people don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear inspiration. Today, people don't want the gospel, they want self-help. They want to be able to know how they can better themselves, not how they can get better for God. But in the church, that place of holiness, that place of sanctification, in the church, we stand on holiness. Uh, we stand on the truth. We stand on the unwavering word of God. If it ain't Christ, it ain't right. While they try so hard to shift the agenda, why they, while they try so intently to be more inclusive, we are inclusive. We love everybody, sinner and saint. Our loving our fellow man hasn't changed, but we hate the sin. No sin is accepted. All sin, all sin, not just a particular group, all sin we must expose. By the grace of God, we are sinners saved by grace. We have enough of Jesus in us, enough Holy Spirit working in our life that when we do sin, Hopefully, we have enough wherewithal to repent of our sins and ask God to forgive us. See, we have an advocate with the Father that when we do sin, and if we call on the name of Jesus and repent, the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The yeast of men is dangerous, but the power of God is awesome. And the only way to counteract the yeast that they're trying to supplant is to speak the truth, to speak the word of the Lord. 
But to speak his word, we have to know it. We have to take time and read it. We have to take time and digest. We must take time and receive it. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. So I stand to tell you that God's word hasn't changed. God has not changed his mind. Neither will he. The only way to see the Lord is through holiness. And the only way to holiness is through the blood. And the only way to the, through the blood is to repent of your sins. That process of salvation has not changed. It will not change. It's worked all this time. I dare to believe it will continue to work. So for those who feel that the words and the traditions of men, that the yeast of men is more valuable and more important because it, it seems to be more conducive to their lifestyle, I say to you that except you repent, the only resolution is hell for you. But to those who have given their lives over to the Lord, who have not only repented but have chosen to live a life with Christ, to you I say your reward is in heaven. Let us walk upright before the Lord and let us maintain the truth of God so that this yeast of men who speak not Christ will not infiltrate our domain. The Lord be with you all.